there's been quite a fair amount of disagreement on key issues. I want to allow uh, uh, the, the, our panelists to respond briefly for a minute, maximum two, if they wish to, to the criticism that they received, and then we open it up. Please. Just, uh, <coughs> don't over, just in one minute. Uh, responding to your thing on, on education, in fact, uh, it's true about the Pritchett study, but on quality of education, it's definitely quality of education matters. And why is good universities important? Not only because you foster innovation, but because good universities form good professors and therefore improve the quality of secondary. And uh, uh, so that I wanted to say, in Switzerland, invest massively in universities, by the way. And, uh, and on industrial policy, I, I think it's a tentative idea of a number of countries do it. I don't say you should give priority to industrial policy. I'm very much libertarian and bottom up. But I think the idea that you should rule out completely all, in, all, all form of industrial policy altogether, I think the, if more the approach is to say, at least do it work, select uh, the best, minimize the first order mistakes whenever this is involved. And, and there is maybe a way to think about governing it better and reconciling it with the Schumpeterian process of selection. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will pick up directly on that because um, I, I agree entirely with the relevance of sectoral policy. Exactly. But in, in the United States, as it happens, we've had sectoral poli industrial policy as a second order effect of strategic policy decisions made without direct respect whatsoever to commercial innovation. The Cold War Defense Department taking over Vannevar Bush's vision of the endless frontier for science with the Office of Naval Research financing some of the most esoteric physics imaginable beginning in 1950. And then, of course, the original Sputnik moment, which, among other things, led to the National Defense Education <coughs> Act. Uh, let me repeat that, the National Defense Education Act, which was what authorized federal funding for higher education in the United States for the first time since the Morrill Act created the land-grant colleges. So that's one thing. Uh, the second is a point I probably should have made in the presentation I want to emphasize. I talked about Keynesian waste very briefly, and I talked about Schumpeterian waste a lot. But there's a coupling between the two. Very simply, the greater the degree of Keynesian waste, the impact on the Schumpeterian process is entirely perverse. If the essence of Schumpeter's vision is creative destruction, the higher the level of unemployment, the more destruction, the less creation. The lower the level of unemployment, the higher the level of demand, those whose careers, whose lives, whose jobs are threatened with destruction can more likely be pulled into new employment. So there's a direct coupling where the notion of minimizing Keynesian waste does indeed support the longer term supply side Schumpeterian process. Uh, uh, let, me, let me exercise the prerogative of the moderator for a second. Just imagine the situation that when President Obama came in, he would have just gone for green investment as a major part of the stimulus. And imagine how he would have looked politically when the oil spill hit, hit and he had to go on television and say what the government is doing and he would have said, look, look what we have done with your money. We already have dealt with, we're dealing with this matter. Just imagine where his political fortunes would have been mm -hmm. and what the midterm elections would have been. So that tells you what potentially, yeah. what the potential sig political significance of this kind of a de decision to exclude all kinds of sectoral thinking might be. Right. Please, uh, Anatol. Uh, uh, Excuse me. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, okay. sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, so first, uh, uh, Hajun's uh, argument, which I agree with, that the developmental state is, goes way back and talk about a lot of things. And in fact, I think it's an article that I have in a book you edited. I use a the theory of innovative enterprise to uh, show the rationale for the infant industry argument, yeah, sure. basically because it takes time uh, to develop the capabilities before you can be exposed to the market. The, the fear that then the tariff is going to just allow excess profits, and you have to deal with that. You have to, to get rid of that. Okay, but there is, there is a role, uh, and uh, every country has climbed this ladder <laughs> uh, to, to, to develop industry uh, uh, in various ways. And of course, government subsidy, government investment is, 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 a, is another form of this. Uh, the issue of large corporations and, and, 
and me small, medium-sized corporations. I uh, agree that small, medium-sized corporations are extremely important uh, to employment in the economy. Uh, I wouldn't want people to take from the arguments I made that to say that in uh, governing corporations, large corporations, and the way they allocate resources, uh, you just keep investing in those corporations. You can take the people that they're laying off, you can take the money that they're giving to uh, doing on buybacks, and you can create uh, companies. That's, in fact, a lot of the startups in the Japanese case. Yep. That's how they occur. There's a spin-off process. So that, that, that can be done. What it means is that you, and, and some companies have done that in US history and done it quite successfully. So you can do that and, and uh, preserve these capabilities and actually integrate what I call integrating strategic control with organizational learning. That you put people in, in, in charge of these companies who actually have the incentive and ability to develop them, develop them innovatively. The other side of that we experienced with the conglomerate movement of uh, the uh, 1960s, which was the beginning of the breakdown of the old economy business model where people say you could just grow these companies. And in fact, it, it actually the ideology actually came out of GE in the 1950s, I think I have it in my paper, where uh, they were teaching managers you can manage anything, and GE grew into a totally uncontrollable uh, conglomerate uh, before Jack Welch took it over and just said we'll be number two by just getting, one or two by getting rid of every uh, thing that we're no good at. Um, uh, that then became what business schools were teaching in, in the 1960s. Now it's, it's shareholder value. It's a different, different ideology, uh, probably more destructive now. Uh, th that and many of the other things that I, that I mentioned about what you could do with this money if, in fact, you govern the corporation differently and looking at an industry by industry basis. So in, in the, the drug industry, uh, you don't buy this argument that we're spending all the money on R&D. You just say, well, how are you actually spending the money? And you say, you're not spending it all R&D, so we're not going to give you the high prices. And this is, this is, this is debated in Congress all the time. Uh, or you could uh, basically uh, uh, say that you have to uh, uh, um, uh, pay taxes, as I said, in the case of a company like Intel or other companies that recognize you've gained from innovation, now let's get the payback because we have to renew the knowledge base. We have to renew the infrastructure on which uh, clean tech can build, et cetera. Thank you. So let's open it up to the floor. Uh, Anato. Anato Pulaski. Uh, yeah, uh, well, I think this has been an absolutely terrific panel uh, because perhaps serendipitously the three main talks have all. Uh, it's not working. Uh, but certainly I'm aware of because I wrote a book a year ago about many of these very same issues which was distributed perhaps to some of them. And I think uh, the first two talks asked two really interesting questions. Uh, Bill asked about the paradox of why we have a system that tolerates so much Keynesian waste and discourages Schumpeterian waste. Uh, Philippe uh, asked why there seems to be such resistance to the concept of a more effective state. Uh, well, I think Bill Lazonic's presentation actually answered both those questions. You know, why do we tolerate Keynesian waste, not Schumpeterian waste? Why does, do our politicians not talk about a more effective state, but only a state that is either too large or too small, when the question certainly, as, I, as I've seen in my book, is not about a bigger, uh, a bigger state or a smaller state, but a state that is actually bigger and smaller at the same time. And I think the answer is perfectly clear. This is not because of some kind of market failure or political misunderstanding. It's actually because of very conscious political program that's based, and this is what makes it relevant, I think, here, that's based on an all-encompassing, legitimizing economic ideology 
of market fundamentalism. And so what I would like to propose, and if there's any reaction, is I think that Bill should really have added one more item to his program to save the US economy, which I think is very <laughs> crucial and which is relevant to the people here, which is that the economics profession must now stand up and expose and even denounce the delusions and falsehoods of technical market fundamentalist neoclassical economics, which many of us have been teaching and which really underpin and legitimize all the dysfunctions that this panel has described. So I think it's very, very relevant to all our professional lives. <laughs> I, I, thank you, Anatole. I, I, would, I, I would second this by saying somewhat self-servingly, so you'll forgive me, that we need to move beyond mechanical markets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. It's about the very important issue of uh, whether uh, education uh, uh, is important or not. And it's not a question, it's uh, data, which is very dramatic in the sense of uh, the relevance of education. In the first two years after liberalization in Poland, the first uh, 14 country, uh, counties out of 3,000, which had uh, 10, uh, 12 uh, years per capita education, they uh, quadrupled the number of new uh, companies in that region. However, the, uh, la the last ones with uh, less than nine years per capita, which uh, were uh, 1,500, uh, they, of course, uh, divided by half the number of companies. Uh, ask, we have, uh, oops, so let's move to the question. No, it's not a, uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's a comment, uh, but I thought that uh, it's a kind right. of substantiate yeah, such yeah, an extreme. Yeah, uh, thank you. A lot of questions, yes. Uh, there are three... Uh, just Please introduce to, yourself. Uh, I'm Sony Kapoor, I run a think tank called Redefine. And uh, very quickly, I mean, the three categories of investments that are important, small, medium enterprises, green, and infrastructure, which the financial system we have today is particularly bad at financing. And in fact, many of the inherent structures of the financial system penalize that. And just taking the example of the green, uh, green uh, investments, I mean, the investment horizon being short means anything that is a higher capital cost but, uh, but much lower fixed co uh, operating cost of the long term gets penalized. The compensation structures, risk is underpriced. If you look at long term investors, uh, I used to advise the Norwegian government, if you look at the Norwegian oil fund, uh, which has an infinite investment horizon because they're only ever going to use the principal, uh, out of its 10 largest investments, five are in oil companies. Mm -hmm. And so th this also actually puts a question mark on be it the financial markets, which are not good at making these sorts of decisions, but also governments, which haven't quite succeeded. And I mean, all the new money comes in from oil. Norway is heavily exposed to oil technology. And what could be a better uh, investment uh, for diversification purposes? But the oil fund doesn't do it. Uh, the accounting standards we have, the tax stuff we have, there are all these imperfections in the financial system which are stacked up against exactly the kind of desirable investments we need. So the quick question is, to what extent is it the problem of the financial system as we have, where the state has a role in correcting those problems, and to what extent is it a question of taking these investments out of the financial system and having the state more directly involved? because these might result in different policy prescriptions. This is, uh, so why don't we just take, this is actually the question that links up with, with the rest of the conference, and it's, it's fundamental, and given the history of, 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 of uh, communist economies is actually quite an important. So why don't we let the panel tell us what they think about that issue. Just very briefly on the, on the, on the uh, last question, I think, what, what may motivate, you know, sectoral intervention is a mixture of financial market imperfection and externalities. And uh, uh, that's the kind of rationale if you look at the theory model. You know, why, why would you, alors now you have to identify which limits, how to do it, how to, uh, 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 and of course we are basically Schumpeter, we basically believe in bottom up, but we also know that there are big externalities and financial market imperfection that prevent reallocation that should take place, and that might be the case for it's doing, uh, that, that's, uh, you should uh, take over. Well, I, I think you have to separate out 
uh, and it's not ever going to be clear and absolutely clean, but distinguish different kinds of investment in different kinds of enterprises. For example, in, in, in the innovation economy, for example, uh, the United States was a kind of laboratory that demonstrated in the age of electrification that public power and private power could both deliver the juice. And the uh, municipal power companies, some of which continue to exist, uh, did a fine job uh, while the market took over in the 20s and created a phenomenal frenzy of financing uh, unconnected uh, power companies, which were then um, uh, broken up at, by the New Deal and one of the least, most neglected uh, 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 innovations in public policy, which was the Public, uh, public Utility Holding Company Act. Uh, now you take that and you could say, yes, there's clearly a role for the state in building power stations, right? Um, it happened that a lot of them were built because there was a stock market boom, so the capital was really cheap to do it when it was a growth industry. But then if you go over to the world that I lived in as a practitioner for 35 years, uh, high tech, the, uh, to eliminate this market, the financial markets, as a principal funder, in my view, would radically reduce the willingness and increase the risk aversion of angel and venture investors both because the dirty secret about venture capital, IPOs, and the stock market is venture capital returns are intimately correlated with stock market performance and the existence of an IPO market. And two, the reason is that gives the investor the chance to win even when the project loses, which of course is the history of biotechnology. The decoupling, Mark's got this absolutely right, the decoupling of the financial asset from the real assets that, that it represents so that it can be sold into the market independently of what the fundamental after the fact actually turns out to be is the essence of innovative finance at the frontier of what I call economic discovery. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that and maybe I can go back to this uh, argument which I've always found kind of useless, a notion of picking winners, because it really is a market-based argument. The government is out there, business is out there, and you just do this stuff, and okay, and you say, okay, this is the industry. That's not the way it works. It works through a collaboration. And I can give you lots and lots and lots of examples. Right. Let me just give one really quickly. The, 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 the modern airline industry uh, was created in, uh, in, in the early 1930s by the Postmaster General's right. office. They, they, they had a meeting in 1925. They created the structure that existed before deregulation. They said, you got this, you got this, okay. They said, we need an airline industry, and, and it was to carry the post. And they gave them a, a subsidy on, uh, based on the amount of, of mail that they, they carried, and this seemed like a good idea. But the idea was the subsidy would then uh, get them to, use plane, to invest in planes that could carry passengers that would be big enough and safe enough, et cetera. This didn't work. So in 1930, they got together in the Postmaster General's office, it's under Republican government, and they said, okay, let's change the subsidy. Rather than being the amount of mail you carry, let's make it the size of the plane you fly, even if you only just have one piece of mail. Right. And that worked. Within three years, uh, Boeing and Douglas had created the modern, you know, single wing fuselage, right. aluminum fuselage air, air, airplane. Uh, the, the story goes on, but the basic, basic thing is there is a collaboration. Now, some people, when you have the collaboration and it's totally untransparent, there's an element of monopoly. Uh, there are people who made lots and lots of money, probably more than they should have because they are on the inside, <coughs> but you did create uh, the modern uh, aircraft, basically, in the United States, uh, and that's how it was done. Bill, the, the, the iconic stock and company of the 1920s tech bubble in the stock market was RCA. Mm -hmm. created by that extreme radical Herbert Hoover as Secretary of Commerce who orchestrated the creation of a patent pool between GE and Thomson and all, all the American companies so that the U.S. wouldn't be dependent on the British for wireless communication. Peter, you want to 
there, there, there's another, uh, another example if you look in the automotive industry in this country. Um, actually, we're talking to, to a lot today about uh, startups. Um, uh, we forgot this was the startup industry. Uh, about 3,000 firms were uh, created. Right. Uh, out of the 3,000, uh, 30 had an IPO. And what's today left is uh, two and a half or something like this, uh, if you uh, include Chrysler with this. So uh, we forget that all industries who exist today were a startup business at, right. at a time sure. and were funded. They didn't have the name of the angels and they didn't have the name of venture capital. Right. But traditionally, they've been funded for hundreds of years in the same, uh, in the same way. And lastly, Mark, um, angels invest, uh, fund about 60% of all tech startups are funded by angels about three times as much in the volume than normal venture capital. So it's the most under-researched, under-known, um, and underestimated and maybe overtaxed sector uh, <laughs> of the uh, venture capital industry. Yeah. Kajun, you want to? Yes. Uh, well, I'm not sure whether we can neatly distinguish large firms, small firms, I mean, startups, uh, established firms, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Schumpeter is one of my intellectual heroes, but. One thing he got completely wrong was, like, you know, that if you read his capitalism, socialism, and democracy, he argued that as uh, that the innovation process becomes uh, bureaucratized in large firms, and the company being taken over by what he disparagingly called uh, the executive types, capitalism will lose its dynamism and yeah. be replaced by socialism. Uh, that's uh, what he got completely wrong, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. capitalism became even more dynamic uh, afterwards. Yeah with bureaucratization. So I, I think uh, we need to be that, a bit more careful in uh, not kind of uh, the putting these things into dichotomy. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me make a comment about uh, something that I actually think needs to be brought out. I'm sorry, I, I'm coming in. That if indeed, of course I agree with the comments, that I, if indeed the capital markets are so crucial in ultimately selecting the winners and the IPOs and everything, then we have to then try to and maybe, I mean, the perspective that Mike Goldberg and I had is that we need to bring back the perspective that perhaps within a certain range, the fluctuations in those markets are also movements in relative prices that help us in that selection. And that should be, that should inform our thinking about the, the extent of financial reforms to deal with both the allocated properties of markets and their potential misallocations. So just to bring it back to the rest of the conference. And, and, and just uh, to be clear, I was not trying to create a heroic role for the venture capital or the venture capital industry because, in fact, uh, my own research would show that uh, what appeared to be a venture capital industry from the 80s and 90s might be thought of more as a transient epiphenomenon built on the back of the greatest bull market in the history of capitalism. Uh, the 10 year return on the NBCA index is now not only negative, it's more negative than the NASDAQ index and capital is fleeing the sector. So, uh, I, I don't know what to do. Can we, move, can we take it for another 10 minutes to give a few? No. no. We're done. I mean, this is a crucial issue, and obviously, I'm sorry about the fact that we don't have more time. And I'm told that I can I can't do it. Okay. Ten minutes? No. No. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs>